Ago, but the first day of school, who remembers? First day of school can be rough for some of us. Some, some of us thrive. First day of school can be rough, right? It means the end of summer. It means the end of sleeping in. It means you got to get back on that schedule. Suddenly you have to do homework again. For some of us, the worst day of school is that first day because you know first day anywhere they start doing all that like get to know you stuff, right? And like extroverts, extroverts love it. They're like, I live for this. I live for it. I just want to share everything about me. But introverts were like, no, I don't know if I want to talk about myself. It's just not the case. Ultimately, right, you get into those situations first day somewhere. We even do it here at Youth Group, i got to admit. But you get into those situations, and the goal of those get-to-know-you exercises is to, like, share something about yourself. Learn about each other. Share your identity, who you are, and, and, and who each person is. And what's interesting is like one person might say, well, yeah, hey, I'm part of the soccer team. And another person might say like, yeah, I do theater. And someone else is gonna be like, I'm a middle child. And everyone's gonna forget what happened after that. Um, yes, where's my middle children at? My brother's one. Oh, look, they all sit together. They, we need to do a study on them. There's gonna be something, right? Yeah, but, but see, what's, what's interesting is like in those get to know you things and we start sharing about ourselves, what's interesting to me is that so often, I think those introductions say a lot about like who our community is and a lot less about who we are. It talks about like, oh yeah, hey, I'm on the soccer team. Well, now I, I know you like to play soccer, but I also know who you surround yourself with, um, right? It, it tells us more about the person's community than maybe about the actual person. And I think we do this on purpose, right? We were created to live life with people. We want to be in community, even those of us who are introverts and even those of us who are totally cool being on our own for a while, we're still made to be with people. Um, and, and we think, we believe that uh, being part of the faith community is one of the best ways to live life with people. So two weeks ago, if you were here, we started this new series called Who We Are. And we kick things off talking about the difference between the big C church and the little C church. Who can tell me about that? What is when I say big C church? What do I mean? Who remembers? Big C church. Worldwide. Worldwide. All believers all over the world and from all time. That's pretty cool. Now, when I say little C church, what do I mean? Who can help me out? No one. Yeah, local churches. That's really good. Local churches just like this one. And we talked about why it's so important to be connected in a local church. We talked about the mission of the local church last time. And um, I want to be clear, like we're not saying like just because we're talking about our local church that like we think our local church is better than anyone else's. Local churches all over the county, all over the country are doing amazing things for the kingdom of Jesus. But if I'm biased, I think ours is pretty great, right? Um, that's why I've been here for so long. The important thing, no matter where you find your local church, is that you find a community of Christ followers who care about you, who love you, and want to see you grow in your relationship with Jesus. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about how the local church is intended to be a community of people with a common goal. And what it looks like for you to connect in a way that's beneficial not only for you, but also for your community. So we're going to be in Hebrews 10 tonight. If you've got your Bibles, turn there. Hebrews 10, we'll have the verses on the screen. It's on your note pages as well. So we're going to kick things off. The author of Hebrews, we don't exactly know who the author is. Some people believe it might be Paul. Some people believe it might be someone else, another important person in the early church. We don't know, so I'm just going to call them the author tonight. Um, and uh, the author of Hebrews gives us a, a great image of what it looks like to live in community together. So we're going to look at Hebrews 10, starting in verse 23. And I realized I made a mistake. I didn't put verse 23 on your handout notes. So I apologize. But it is on the screen, so you can follow along. Hebrews 10, 23 tells us, let us hold tightly, hold firmly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promises. Author here is saying, hey, we need to hold tightly to the hope. What is the hope? The hope is the gospel. The hope is the good news. The hope is all the good teaching, the sound doctrine that we're getting from our Bible. We need to hold, 
Hold firmly to that. Why? Because God can be trusted to keep his promises. Our God's a promise keeper. He trusts his promises. He's always faithful. He doesn't let us down. And so because of that, verse 24, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And I love this. Like, when I read this, I love what the author is saying here. I, 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 when I think of our group, I really hope that this is a place that we do those things, that we hold to the truth of the gospel, the good news that Jesus saves. I hope that this is a place where we believe good teaching and sound doctrine. I hope this is a place where, where everyone is able to come and gather and be encouraged, motivated to acts of love and good work so that together we can love each other, we can meet each other's needs and the needs of the community and the world around us. And if that were it, like that'd be great. We could be like, cool, this is our mission, let's go and do it. But the author knows that, hey, there's a bit of a hiccup in the equation. There's one way to completely disrupt this whole process of holding firmly and, and sticking tight and, and, and encouraging each other, and it happens in verse 25. One way to derail this whole process. The author writes, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, especially now, as the day of his return is drawing near. The truth is, is it can be really difficult to maintain, to find the motivation to hold on to the truth if you're trying to do the Christian life solo. It can be really hard to want to do and find the motivation for love and good works and all the things our faith calls us to do without the support and encouragement and accountability of a really good faith community around us. People who share our hope in Jesus. And that's why meeting together on a regular basis is so important. It's why Christians for thousands of years have said it's so important for us to meet together. Yeah, the weekly gathering is important, but even beyond that, so, so important for us to be together. And so as we follow Jesus, we need to surround ourselves with others who are going to motivate us and encourage us in our faith. When we neglect meeting together, when we don't meet together, when we think it's optional or like, I'll just get around to it when I got some free time, holding on to the hope of the gospel becomes so much harder. When we neglect meeting together, I think it's even more likely like, that, that, that like, we won't hold on to that hope for the long haul because we've got no one supporting us and encouraging us along the way. You know there are days where it's hard to follow Jesus. You know there are days where it's hard to believe. You know there are days where, it's, where like, the doubt creeps in. We've been there. We need other people in our corner to help us. Plain and simple, it's really easy to get discouraged, to get sidetracked, to lose our way um, when we try to follow Jesus by ourselves. We need each other. So before we go any further with this verse, we've got to point out four, four words right here in the middle of verse 25. He says, and not let us, let us not neglect meeting together as some people do. As some people do. Notice that. What's he getting at here? Have you ever been to a place where they've got like a sign or they've got rules and like you read the rule and you're like, that rule doesn't really make sense until you realize that rule's in place because someone actually tried the thing? Yep. Yeah, okay. Here's a couple examples. Check out this one. This one is a sign at a vegan restaurant that says, absolutely no food or drink, including but not limited to, a whole rotisserie chicken, Burgerville burgers for your friend who won't eat vegetables. Yes, we are also surprised that we had to make this sign. Okay, okay. How about this one? A sign at a public park that says, feed a pigeon, lose a finger. You know someone tried it. And uh, how about this one? A sign at the Oakland Museum of California that says, don't lick the paintings. Help us care for our California art. Okay, now you know those rules are in place because someone tried it. Someone did it and they had to make a rule that says, don't do the thing anymore. Um, someone brought a whole rotisserie chicken into a vegan restaurant. They did. I don't know why, but they did. Like, you wonder, like, did they smuggle it in? Like, is it in her purse? Did she pull the chicken out? I don't know. Um, you know someone, maybe they didn't lose a finger, but you know the chicken, chicken won person zero. Like, they lost. And for some reason, someone, someone decided to lick the painting at the museum. Maybe they thought you could lick it and taste it. Maybe it was a, maybe it was fruit. I don't know. But look, I think, I think something similar is going on here in Hebrews 10. That when the author has to write, 
uh, and challenge his readers to not neglect meeting together, it's because that's exactly what they were doing. That's at least some of them. Some of them, I don't know how big the group was, but like people were not meeting together. People were not committing to gathering. They weren't making their community a priority, and it was making it more and more difficult for the church, the believers gathered, to motivate one another toward love and good works. And you've got to think, like, what, what are the acts of good, what are the kind of good works are we talking about in the New Testament? We don't have time to look at all of these, but on the back of your notes, I gave you some extra verses that just talk about what were the good works that the believers were doing in the New Testament. you got Jesus' great commission, go and make disciples, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. That's a great work. You've got places like Acts 2 and Acts 4 that tell us that the believers shared everything they had. They gathered together. They dedicated themselves to the teachings. They sold their belongings, and they gave so that no one had any needs. You've got Paul's letters where he talks about the work he's doing or the work his companions are doing, where they're taking up offerings for churches, and they're meeting needs in their community. You've got places like Acts 7 that says there were widows being neglected, and they assigned people to make sure the widows were cared for. Right? Like the, the early church was doing amazing, amazing work. Amazing work. And guess what? Our church today continues to do amazing work. Um, you know, right now we got holiday opportunities going on. You can, you can give to food to the neighborhood food center for the food drive. We've got Operation Christmas Child just started today. I know it doesn't seem like Christmas like is that close, but it's just two months away. And we gotta get shoeboxes to kids around the world. So we're starting now. Um, you can see Claire. Claire's got Claire's in charge of that with her sister Kendall. So if you've got questions about shoeboxes or you want to learn how to pack a shoebox or you want to learn about where they maybe go to and hear some of the stories, Claire's your person. Talk to her. So there's all these amazing good works. And you know what? When the church isn't gathered to do those things, it doesn't get done. And I think the author of Hebrews knows something, right? Something about what we're learning here. We're better together than we could ever be on our own. But when we go for too long without gathering together, without being together, without hanging out, we start to feel less and less like a community. And it becomes easier and easier to say, yeah, maybe some other time. So even though this letter was written maybe like 1900 years ago to a group of people who are way different from us, um, there's still a lot that we can, we can learn here. Helpful things that if we're willing to recognize them and apply them in our own lives, it's going to transform us as Jesus followers. So I want to highlight a few of those. And yes, that, that dude up there, look, he's gathered with us. Okay? He's, he's just hanging out, paying no mind to the bud. Okay? He's, he's just going to do his thing. But for now, we're going to focus in. Look, junior high guys, you got to stick with me. A few more minutes, guys. A few more minutes. We can do this. We're going to get through it together. I know he's special. We're going to give him a name later. Later. Okay? All right. Let's, let's focus back in. First thing we can learn from this is we got to prioritize a community. Prioritizing community is a choice. I'll be the first to admit it's not always easy to build community. Getting to know other people means I have to show up. I gotta be vulnerable. I gotta be real. And that's not always the most comfortable thing in the world for us to do. There's a lot of times where it'd be easier to stay at a distance, to not engage. Never quite getting close enough to build real, meaningful, lasting relationships. But easier? doesn't mean it's better. And this is definitely one of those cases. Being part of a community that loves each other, that encourages one another, is a process. It doesn't happen all in one day. And those of you who are upperclassmen, those of you who have been around maybe our student ministry for a long time, you know that maybe in junior high it was kind of like, hey, we're getting together, it's kind of fun, whatever. But you know as, a, as an upperclassman, those relationships mean something to you because you've done life with those people. You've been through some real stuff with those people. It doesn't happen all in one day, but you gotta start somewhere. And that starting point is prioritizing the community that you wanna be part of. In our youth group, we wanna give every opportunity possible to be part of the kind of community that the author of Hebrews is talking about here in chapter 10. That's why we provide time every week for small group discussions. We think it's really important for, like we could just end the message and be like, catch you later. But we think it's way more valuable, way more important for us to gather together Talk about life, talk about the message, pray for each other, encourage each other. And um, you know, we think that's where like real community begins is in those small groups. In fact, community is a core value around here at Crossroads. We kind of say it like this, community, um, you guys got that slide? Community, we value disciple making through intentional relationships. 
That's all that is saying is like, look, we want to grow closer together and to Jesus, and we're going to build relationships to help us do that. Small groups are an incredible place where you can gather. You can grow in God, you can grow in your faith. You can ask questions. You can share your thoughts. You can even challenge things when you disagree. You got to do it respectfully, of course. No sass at all. But it's these kind of settings where you have the opportunity to like really dig into things with people and give people a chance to get to know the real you. But it's, it starts with a choice, right? You got to make the decision to make your community a priority. And when we decide to connect in a small group, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta prioritize it. That means making the choice to be here when you are able. Second thing that I think is helpful for, uh, helpful for us to learn from these verses is that authentic community is unselfish. Authentic community is unselfish. You look at those verses in Hebrews 10, and you see one another, one another, together, one another. You know there's over 100 one another's in the New Testament? And that's not even counting all the times where it's together or all the times where like groups of people are there, but it doesn't specifically say one another. Over 100 times. And most of those times are about how we function in community as brothers and sisters in Jesus. Look at that again from Hebrews 10. Let us think of ways to motivate, there it is, one another, to acts of good, to love and good works. Let us not neglect meeting together, as some do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Notice the one another's when you read scripture. See how we're meant to be together, to gather together. And it's not just so that we can be together, but when we do, each of us has something to contribute. Like, we weren't made to just show up to church and sit in these rows and go like, cool message, let's get out of here, and we're done. Like, we were made to contribute to this body of faith, this community. It's not just about what we can get out of it. So community has to be unselfish. You've got something to contribute that nobody else does. Did you know that? You contribute things that nobody else can contribute in this community and in your group. You've got a role to play. If this is your first time, yeah, you've got a role to play too. If you've been here for years, you've got a part to play. When we choose not to be part of it, when we choose not to engage that way, everybody misses out. When you show up, when you bring your full self, when you're real, when you're authentic, everyone benefits, including you because we make that choice to put community first, to be unselfish. So a couple thoughts, uh, we gotta think of how we live this out. What are some steps that we can take this week to begin applying some of these ideas into our life and into our community? We want to grow the kind of community that the author of Hebrews is talking about here in chapter 10. So how are we gonna do it? As we said earlier, we think that this kind of community happens best in small groups, places where you can grow, ask questions, find support. Challenge things, be challenged by things. But that community doesn't just happen by accident. It's gonna take each person in the group saying, yeah, that's the kind of community that I wanna build here. That's the kind of community I want. So if that's you, and I hope it is, here's a few things we can do to make sure our small groups kind of become this, this type of community. First, we've said it, but I'm gonna say it again, you've gotta make your small group a priority. Make your small group a priority, and this is a tough one. For you guys, like you, you are probably the busiest generation of teenagers I have ever seen. I've been working with students for 20 years now, and I've never seen a busier generation than you. And why is that? Like You guys just have more options. You have more options, more things fighting for your time and fighting for attention, and that's not all a bad thing. Um, from sports to theater to band to homework, volunteering for service hours, relationships with friends and family and, and all the other stuff you've got going on, there's stuff demanding your time and attention every single day. The list never stops. And on the one hand, that's awesome because you're going to have opportunities that people have never had before. But it also means you're going to have a lot pulling for your attention. Um, you're going to have to make choices about how you spend your time and you can't say yes to everything. You can't, because every yes you make is a no to something else. It's just how it is. We don't have unlimited time, we don't have unlimited energy. So if you say yes to one thing, it means saying no to at least one other, if not more. And please hear me, like this is not an attempt, I'm not trying to guilt you into saying you spend too much time for other things and you don't come to church enough. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that, you know what, um, we have a lot of opportunities, and I would encourage you, you've got to take them. But it's also your choice about 
how many things can you prioritize? What's realistic? Like realistically, I can't prioritize like 10 things. I might have to focus on two or three so that I have enough time to do two or three things that I want to do and do them well and make time for it. So if you've got opportunities for baseball, you've got opportunities for theater, you got opportunities for band, like do that stuff. It's good. But as you make those choices to decide how you're gonna spend your time, I wanna encourage you, make your small group one of those choices, one of those priority choices. Here's what I mean. If you can be here, be here, right? Pretty self-explanatory. But if you can, the best way to make your small group a priority is to choose to show up. And don't just show up physically, you gotta show up mentally too. Be ready to engage, be ready to jump in. If you can be here, be here. Second, only miss when it's important. We get it, stuff comes up, life happens, someone gets sick, you go out of town. Your band director changed the time of the band thing and now you gotta do a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday night. Like, we get it, stuff comes up. Um, there's a lot of important things going on. Um, so we're not saying skip all your important stuff, but remember, it's up to you to decide how much important stuff is going to be part of your life. So only miss when it's important. And then last one, we don't talk about this one enough, follow up when you're not here. Chances are your small group leader probably reaches out to you if you've missed one or two weeks. But one of the best ways that you can take the responsibility and show the rest of your group that they're still a priority is to reach out. Send a text in the group chat. Let them know you weren't there. Let them know you missed them. Let them know what came up. Stuff like that goes a long way when you're building community together. So, make your small group a priority. Number two, when you're in your small group, choose honesty. In a few minutes, we're gonna go to small group like we do every week. And when we get there, you have a choice. You got two options. Option A says, I'm gonna bring my full, honest, real self to the conversation. I'm gonna bring my ups, I'm gonna bring my downs, I'm gonna bring my highs, I'm gonna bring my lows, I'm gonna bring my triumphs, and I'm gonna bring my struggles. And I'm not gonna hide it. I'm a person in progress and in process, and the Lord's doing work. We don't always get it right, but I'm gonna bring my full, honest, real self to the conversation. Or you can go with option B. I'm gonna hide who I really am, and I'm gonna pretend my way through it just so I can get to the other side. People ask me how I'm doing, I'm gonna smile and I'm gonna say, I'm fine. I'm not gonna talk about what's going on in my life. I'm only gonna share the surfacey stuff. We realize it takes time to develop deep relationships, but we got two choices. Bring your full honest self or pretend to be someone you're not. Option A, option B. It can be difficult to be honest and vulnerable. I'm speaking from my own experience here been in a lot of small groups, I've been in a lot of contexts where I get to decide who am I gonna bring, who am I gonna present to others, and there are times where I don't wanna talk about what's going on in my own life. I've shared before some of my own story, I've struggled with depression, I've struggled with anxiety, I've struggled with suicidal ideation. Do you realize how hard it is to bring those things to the table? I know you do, because you've gone through it too. And sometimes we don't feel like church is the place where we There are times where I've royally messed up. I've sinned when I said I wouldn't. One more time, one more time. And I got a choice if I could bring that to the table, to my community. Am I gonna seek encouragement there? Or am I gonna hide it? Because I just want everyone to think I've got it all figured out. It can be easy for us to pretend that we're okay when we're not. We hold back because we think people will look at us different or judge us. Um, if you've ever felt that way, I get it. I'm sorry. We hope that this place, you guys feel safe, you feel that you can be your real self. We want to create environments where we feel comfortable, we feel safe, we can just be real about what's going on in our lives. Uh, we don't want people to feel like they've got to hide who they are just to fit in. Um, none of us are perfect, we're all trying to figure out how do, we, how do we live life with Jesus together in this community, and so we're gonna to try to do that to the best of our ability. Um, but we can't do that unless we're honest with each other. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Ephesians 4, 25. He says, stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for, your, for we are all parts of the same body. He says, we're Christians together in this body. We're following Jesus together in this church. Stop lying to each other. Don't fake it anymore. Let's be real. Let's be honest. We're trying to accomplish the same thing here. We're trying to figure out life. We're trying to figure out our relationship with God. We're trying to figure out how to navigate all this faith stuff. 
Um, but we've got to be honest with each other, with ourselves, to be able to do it. So let's change that today as you go to your small groups in a few minutes. Be honest. Yeah, it might be scary at first. I agree with you. It takes a little bit of time to warm up to that idea. I get it. But that's the goal. Let's shoot for it. Last thing we can do, number three, encourage each other. The author of Hebrews said that's one of our goals in meeting together is so that we can encourage each other all the more as we see the day, the return of the Lord approaching. Imagine for a moment you're in a small group and someone decides, hey, I've been present, I'm showing up, I've made it a priority, I'm going to be my real and honest self. And uh, when, they, when they decide that that's who they're going to be, they're going to be honest, then they start to share and open up in their group. How you respond as a group will determine whether that person feels safe enough to continue sharing. So when someone shares something from their heart, something that's meaningful, something that's real, I want to challenge you, decide ahead of time, how are you going to respond to them? I'm going to give you a couple examples. For example, if someone in your group decides to share that they aren't sure whether they really believe in Jesus or not, you've got a choice of how you're going to respond. A great response might be, hey, I get it. I'm glad you're here. I hope that we can kind of walk through this and figure this thing out together. Let's work on it, right? Let, let's, let's figure this out together. Like, we don't have to be like, well, you don't believe in Jesus? It's so easy. Can't believe you don't believe in Jesus. Like, we all believe in Jesus. What's wrong with you? Like, don't, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Um, what about if someone shares that they're really struggling with something? Maybe some kind of sin, something hidden. Uh, maybe even something like, like they're just angry. Um, and even they know they, the, 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 the anger is not helpful, right? A great response might be, hey, thanks for sharing that. Thanks for being real. Thanks for being honest. Yeah, hey, that's a struggle for me too. It's a struggle for all of us. Um, but I know that we can hold each other accountable. I know that we can, we can work toward overcoming that. How can I pray for you this week? You see how like responses like that totally like change the situation? The way that we respond in our small groups makes all the difference. And the author of Hebrews says that, hey, um, when we respond those kind of ways, when we offer encouragement, when we challenge each other in these right ways, uh, that's the way to go. And you know what? I totally agree. we got to do this. So let's do it together. So uh, in a moment, hey, I'm going to pray for us. A uh, reminder, as we've been talking about the priority of small groups, your small groups are important tonight. Your small group outings are super important next week. Show up to them. Don't just be friends while you're here. Be friends outside of this place, too. Um, small group outings are going to be a great way for you to Continue to invest in your small group in those relationships, all that good stuff. So, uh, hey, let's pray, and we're gonna we're gonna dismiss the groups. God, thanks for tonight, and uh, God, we thank you for your word. Thanks for places like the Book of Hebrews that remind us and encourage us the importance of the community that we find ourselves in, the community that we build, the community that we need to prioritize. So, God, I I pray for us. I pray for our group. We know that good small groups don't just happen. So, God, would you help us? Wherever we're, we are, wherever we're at, like, help us to make our small groups the best place they can be. They can be places for fun. They can be places for serious. They can be places to get real. They can be places to find encouragement and support. Places that will challenge us and hold us accountable. But ultimately, God, that these are places that, that we can grow to be more like Jesus and follow him together. Surrounded by people who are trying to do the same thing. So God, would you help us to do that? Would you help us to create those kind of communities? As small group leaders, God, give us the wisdom in how we lead our small groups. Father, for the rest of us, to make it a priority, to be real, to look for ways to build up and encourage others. Be with us as we go to our groups in Jesus' name.